Patrick, for today, we are so grateful to have you here. And I think it's your first session with us at the Mentor Centre. So we have known about you for a long time and we're very grateful that you've accepted our invitation to not only give one talk, but two talks to all of us. So very grateful for that. And today's session, um, it's going to be open to however you like it to run, but usually our sessions, we can start with some short meditation, maybe 10, 15 minutes, guided by you, um, then followed by your talk, which is on practicing for insight, a lovely title. And then after that, uh, opening the room for question and answers. So if you could give us at mm -hmm. least half an hour perhaps at the end, and I can facilitate the questions. And if anyone has any questions, they can pop it into the chat or they can unmute themselves and ask those questions. Is that okay? And uh, how long should the talk be? Um, probably until eight, if not finish a bit earlier. So now it's 7.15. Uh, uh, so 7.15 is so now. So and six, okay. And so the talk will go until eight, 45 minutes? Yeah, 45 minutes, yeah. And okay. then we'll have a bit of meditation at the beginning. So play it by ear. But if you're finding that you're um, on a roll and your talk is going, it's totally fine to continue on as well. We're very flexible. Okay, okay. good. Thank you. So, Thank you. Um, uh, so you'll, will you ring the bells for the talk? I mean, for the meditation? I'm, I'm happy for you to do it. So you can um, choose however long you would like us to talk for. So just as a short intro though, Patrick, um, I'd love to just introduce you to the people who are here. We have some people joining us in person as well as those online. So for those who don't know, Patrick Carney, he has been a very long-term practitioner and teacher, and his talk tonight will be on insight vipassana, and specifically insight as understood in the Mahasi Fado lineage. And some um, information about Patrick. Patrick has practiced mindfulness meditation, Satipatthana Vipassana, since 1977. And at that time, there was little or no Buddhist meditation training available in Australia. So he spent years traveling in Australia, in Asia and the US, working with different teachers from different Buddhist traditions to learn the craft of meditation practice. Most of his training has been in the insight meditation lineage of Mahasi Sado of Burma, which included several years as a Buddhist monk as well. And his main teachers were Thedor Upandita and John Hale. And he's also trained in the Diamond Sangha lineage of Zen. Now Patrick has been a full-time teacher of mindfulness meditation for over 20 years. And he conducts residential and online retreats as well as workshops and seminars. And he's studied early Buddhist, Buddhism at postgraduate levels and has a particular interest in the original teachings of the Buddha before the invention of Buddhism. So we are so grateful to have you again, um, Patrick, to be here with us and to share the Dhamma with all of us tonight. We have in the room people who are long-term practitioners as well as also some people who are beginning the journey with um, their Dhamma practice. So okay. I will now hand over to you to lead the guided meditation. Give me a couple of minutes. I'm going to fill up my water bottle and get a bell so I can time the, the meditation. I'll no be right back. Sure. Three bells. We'll begin with three bells. And then we'll go for maybe 15 minutes. And then we'll have a couple of bells and that'll be indicate the end. So the, the purpose of the bell is to kind of set aside the time. And um, also we're listening to it. And that uh, hearing is part of the meditation process. But this may become clear as we go through. Well, let's begin. So settling awareness in your body, feeling with your body. You're listening, you're hearing the sounds, in this case, the sound of the bell, the sound of my voice. You can see, unless you've got your eyes closed. And you can feel touch. So let's say you're sitting in a chair, 
You can feel the contact of your feet on the floor, perhaps. You can feel where your body is supported at the base of the body. If your chair has a back, you can feel the support at the back. So settle your awareness in these different sensations and just feel your body. You notice the simplicity of what we're doing. Just feel what is happening. As you're feeling your body, you might feel sensations. You might also feel the movements of your breathing. You don't need to give anything any particular importance. But just feel what is whatever is happening. And of course, there's also thought buzzing about. You might be telling yourself stories. Just let them go and come back to your body. And just feel your body. Breathe and relax. Particularly on your exhalation. You might just relax. There's nothing to do. Just relax. And as you relax, feel your body. When the thinking pops up, just notice that you are thinking and come back to your body. Do the bell again because that you couldn't hear it because I had the wrong setting. So we'll try again and just listen. Notice how the sound comes and goes and appears out of nowhere, it's present, and it disappears. But you notice that your body sensations do the same thing. They appear, they do their thing, and then they disappear. You might notice that your thoughts are doing the same thing. They appear, they do their thing, and they disappear. Just notice how things are coming and going, appearing and disappearing.
Did your attention wander off? What's happening now? You don't need to get anywhere. You just have to remember what's happening now. It could be sensation, it could be thought, it could be sound. It doesn't matter. But what's happening now? What is clear now? What is obvious now? Have you been distracted? What's happening now? And is what's happening now? Is it appearing? Is it doing its thing? And then is it disappearing? Notice those movements how things come and go, including your attention. That comes and goes. Don't fight it. Just be interested and watch it.
what is clear now. What is obvious now? Back to your body, feel sensation, and back to your mind, feeling thinking. You notice how things appear, and then they dance, and then they cease. Just let them. But watch them as they come and go.
Okay. Coming out of that. And I have to ask, did you hear the bell that time? Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord. Very technical, getting Zoom to do things. Okay, so that um, it was a kind of brief foray into what we could call an ins insight meditation style of practice. So what I'd like to do now is launch into the talk um, in which we talk about uh, practicing toward insight. So as you know, when the Buddha uh, talks about meditation, he talks about uh, meditation for serenity, samatha, and he talks about meditation for insight, vipassana. And you get a whole range of different techniques. Some specialise in one, some specialise in the other, uh, some blend them. So here we're going to talk about uh, practicing for insight in the context of the Mahasi lineage. So we're talking about the teaching of Mahasi Sayadaw, who lived a Burmese uh, monk, who lived 1904 to 1982 and he was one of the great revivers of insight meditation in Burma and his lineage has spread throughout the world. He was quite influential. So let's, we're just going to talk about how he understands the practice and he, if you read English translations of his writings, of course he never spoke in English, he spoke, he taught in Burmese but his uh, students translated into English and what they emphasised was as the centre of the practice is the idea of noting, to note the meditation object. Now here to note, despite in, in English it has a bit weird, uh, but what it, in Burmese what it means is to directly aware whatever is happening. So for example, if I ring the bell and I say, can you hear the bell? Well, what I'm asking you is, did you directly aware the sound? Can you feel the sensations of your body? Are you directly awareing the sensations of your body? Are you being distracted by thought? Can you watch the thinking? Can you aware the thinking? So this is noting, directly awareing whatever is happening. Um, now, when people, when this is incredibly simple, uh, uh, the um, uh, the simplicity of it is actually what makes it so difficult. Uh, did anybody suffer from what we could kind of call distraction? Does that happen to anyone? Perhaps not for this group, <laughs> but other groups, people would say yes quite frequently. Um, it's difficult to actually simply directly aware whatever is happening and especially to do it over a period of time. Well, why is it difficult? It's difficult because we, get, we tend to get lost in our concepts about our experience rather than being intimate with the experience itself. Um, we tend to live in the world of concepts. We tend to live in a world in which what we take to be real is what we think is real or what we assume is real. Um, but what we want to do is to move into a world in which we're simply interested in how this experienced event right now, how it presents to me right now, what it does. For example, um, I said I, I kind of made certain suggestions. Have you noticed that sensations appear? And they dance, they cease. Have you noticed that thoughts appear? They dance, they cease. Now obviously I'm prodding you in a certain direction. Um, so, um, in other words, have we, do we notice that things change? And they change in ways that are beyond our control. How many people would say, I was in absolute control of my experience 
during this meditation period? Well, probably no one. We don't control experience. It changes, and it changes in ways that are out of our control. And the Buddha is constantly talking about this in terms of anicca, dukkha, anatta. Um, so, when we are lost in the world of concept, then what we tend to do is to become lost in judgment about our experience. My experience is good. My experience is not good. My experience is satisfying. My experience is disappointing. And so on. But when we stay with what this experience does, with how we are experiencing it, noticing its dynamism, then we become interested in the flow of experience, the structure of experience. And we're not particularly, we don't care whether it's good or bad, acceptable or unacceptable, meditative or not meditative, because we recognize these are, these are just ideas, these are just concepts. But what I'm interested in is what's actually happening. Now this takes us to the world of what the Buddha calls the dharmas, in Pali the dhammas, in plural. So of course you've all heard Pali word dhamma, uh, Sanskrit and English equivalent is Dharma and uh, this Pali word Dhamma has a variety of meanings so for example the Buddha's Dharma the Buddha's teaching uh, sometimes you see the word in the plural so Dharma's Dhamma's plural in, uh, depending on whether we're talking Pali or Sanskrit um, now when, he's, when he uses it in the plural what he means is um, how we experience things. So, uh, Mahathir Sayadaw, for example, he, he tells us that what we think is real, what reality, quote-unquote, comes to us in two forms. What we directly experience firsthand through the senses. And for the Buddha, of course, this includes mind. So what we directly experience firsthand and what comes to us indirectly, second-hand, through concept about what we directly experience. So if I have any thought about my meditation practice, do you notice they're about? They're not the actual practice. They're thoughts about. They're second-hand. Um, one, one step removed. Now for the, uh, for the Buddha, First-hand direct experience is associated with understanding and insight. Experience made up of second-hand concepts is associated with delusion and the suffering that accompanies delusion. Mm -hmm. This is really central, particularly for meditation. Um, so, uh, in the Theravada, um, in Theravada Buddhism, direct first-hand experience is called ultimate reality, paramatta, um, which I think is spelled exactly the same as the center of Sydney, but I think this is just coincidence. So direct first-hand experience is called ultimate reality, while second-hand experience, in other words, concepts about what we directly experience, is called conventional reality. When we're practicing meditation, when we are noting, when we are directly aware of whatever is happening, and this is the basic discipline of the practice, um, we're training ourselves to ground our perception in ultimate reality, in the world of directly experienced events, in the world of dharmas or dhammas. And this is the world where insight arises. Is this making sense so far? Any questions? We're getting very technical. We're talking about ultimate reality and conventional reality. But it does boil down to what we directly experience and concepts about what we directly experience. And our habit is to live in this second world of concepts about. So let me give you an example. Have you ever had the experience of having done a meditation session, it might be one session, it might be a whole retreat. You finish it and you think, well, that was a complete waste of time, wasn't it? Have you ever had that experience? 
Have you ever thought, oh, that was hopeless? Uh, you notice that that is a judgment about the experience. It's not the experience. The experience itself is something different. It could be the experience of restlessness. So, my mind was too restless, I couldn't settle down, therefore it's no good. But the direct experience of restlessness is ultimate reality. That's exactly what we're looking for. And yet, we don't take that seriously. We assume the experience should be something, like it should be blissful and meditative and lots of samadhi and so on and so forth. And we don't notice that all of that are just concepts. They're concepts about. They're not the actual experience. But we put all our importance into the concepts about. And we judge the direct experience insofar as whether or not it lives up to the standards set by the concepts. But the concepts aren't important. What's important is the direct experience. So the meditation practice is the, involves the discipline of simply staying with the direct experience. That's all. But nothing more. That's the discipline. Very, very simple. Very, very difficult because it goes against all our habits. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question, just go ahead and do so. Otherwise, I'll just keep rabbiting on. Um, now, uh, what the Buddha is saying is that when we're practicing for insight and we're just sticking with what is actually happening, um, we start to see change. We start to see a nature, impermanence, uh, and we develop what the Buddha calls a nature sangha, the perception of impermanence, or the perception of change. So, and this is built into direct first-hand experience. Uh, now normally what we've been doing all our lives is we've been training ourselves to live in the perception of permanence, of not change. And Buddha is saying, now what you want to do now is actually develop the opposite perception, the perception of change. Um, let's, um, let's take a, a, a debate in contemporary Buddhism. Um, the, take, take, the, take, for example, a concept of something we have not directly encountered. Let's say rebirth. So the Buddha teaches rebirth. Um, does this actually exist? Is this doctrine true? Now, some people believe it, and they believe it because authoritative texts and teachers say it is true. Some people disbelieve it because it contradicts their belief in scientific materialism. And both you find both of these positions being held by people who practice Buddhist meditation. Now, these two positions are diametrically opposed to each other. But what do they have in common? They're just concepts. Has anyone directly experienced rebirth? Now some people claim to have memories of a previous life, but these memories are themselves concepts. They're creations of the mind, they may correspond to an actually encountered first-person experience that occurred in the past, or they may not. But basically, they're just concepts. And what do concepts have in common? All concepts, including concepts that completely disagree with each other. They appear as permanent, as nietzsche. Now, permanent, when the Buddha talks about permanent, he doesn't necessarily mean lasting forever and ever. He means lasting unchanged over time. This is what uh, Nietzsche, not permanent, means for the Buddha. Something that lasts unchanged over time, regardless of the unit of time. Let's say, for example, 
Let's say that 10 or 20 years ago, I decided that Buddha must be right, there is rebirth if he says so. Let's say that 10 or 20 years ago, I decided that regardless of what the Buddha says, there is no rebirth. It's scientifically impossible. So I've taken that position. Has this concept and my relationship to this concept changed over the past 10 or 20 years? Apparently not. It's permanent. Using permanent in the sense that the Buddha uses it, unchanging over time. And it's permanent because it's just a concept. So concepts are permanent in the sense that they remain stable over time. So let's go back to our rebirth example. We don't spend all of our time thinking about rebirth. So let's say that you are one of those uh, people who do not believe in rebirth. And let's say you're listening to a Dharma talk where the speaker says, look, rebirth is true. And if you don't believe it, you cannot be a Buddhist and you cannot gain enlightenment. Now, as you listen to this talk, you may get agitated. Are you trying to propagandize me? Are you saying that I have to accept an orthodoxy I do not believe in order to succeed in this practice? Now what is happening? You are having a direct first-hand experience of listening to this talk and a direct first-hand experience of the agitation that is arising from the listening. Let's say that you're listening to this talk and you are a believer in rebirth. You think, this is great, at last someone's putting it down there. Then you may be having a direct first-hand experience of satisfaction, a felt sense of confirmation of your belief and the satisfaction that the truth is finally being revealed. Now these experiences, listening to, responding to this talk, these experiences are direct, first-hand, and they are changing. They are not permanent. They do not last over time. If you listen to someone else saying the same thing the next night, the concept will be exactly the same. But the felt encounter with the talk, the responses that arise in mind and body, would be different from the previous night. These direct first-hand experiences are not permanent. Um, but concepts are stable. Concepts stay unchanged over time. So when we, nor we live normally in the world of concepts, so we live in a world of permanence, but the practice of noting, the practice of directly awareing whatever is happening right now, reveals a world which is clearly impermanent, subject to change. And it's in this world that understanding can begin to emerge. Because for the Buddha, the perception of change is the entry into insight. And of course for the Buddha, that which is anicca, that which is changing and therefore unreliable, is dukkha, is inherently unsatisfactory. And that which is dukkha is not self. And the recognition of these three universal characteristics constitutes insight. Any questions? I know we're, we're kind of jumping in the deep end here. Am I making sense? Yep. One person thinks so. I'm glad we've got one vote. So let's move on. Um, so in one very famous teaching, the Buddha says, Sabbe Sankara Anicca, Sabbe Sankara Dukkha, Sabbe Dhamma Anatta. If you're look, uh, looking for this, this is the Upada Sutta um, arising. Anguttara Nikaya, Book of the Threes, number 136. Now this could be translated as all constructions are impermanent, all constructions are painful, all phenomena are not self. Um, 
Now, when the Buddha is talking about construction, sankhana, uh, basically a, a construction is something that is put together, constructed, created. So, for example, um, this building that I'm in is a, is a construction. Someone built it. The building that you're in is a construction. Someone built it. This meeting is a construction. We're all building it. This talk is a construction. So a construction is anything that's put together out of parts. And of course for the Buddha, anything that's put together out of parts, sooner or later, it will fall, fall apart. It will cease. This is just built into the understanding. So he says all constructions are impermanent and painful. Um, so if we ask, well, what are constructions? What are sankharas? Basically everything, everything in the universe, except for the unconstructed, the asankata, otherwise known as the not born, the not become, the not made. Hence the third statement, all phenomena are not self. So you notice that the constructions have disappeared and that we're replaced by phenomena. This translates dhammas, dharmas, directly encountered events. And all of them are not self. But you notice that they're not all, they're not uh, um, subject to uh, change and dissatisfaction. So, um, Now look at the look at the claim being made. All constructions are in, are impermanent. Now this is a very bold claim. Let's say I am a dedicated practitioner of insight meditation. Let's say that whenever I directly aware whatever is happening, I recognise that the experience I am having, a sankhara, a dharma, I recognise it's impermanent, subject to change. Now in terms of my direct first-hand experience, I can say whenever I note, whenever I directly aware something, whatever I note, whatever I directly aware, turns out to be impermanent, subject to change. Now would you agree with that? Have you ever directly aware something that never changed? Or have you found that every time you're directly aware of something, it changes? Okay, great. But what about all of those constructed experiences that I have, I have not noted? What about all of those experiences that occurred before I started meditating? What about all those experiences that will occur in the future? So I haven't noted them. I haven't directly aware them. I have no direct first-hand experience of them. So any idea that I have about them is what? It's a concept. And doesn't that mean that any belief I have in their impermanence is just a return to the world of concepts? Isn't the Buddha, with all this stuff about just stay directly with the experience, don't go into concept. Doesn't he just take us to a paradox, where at the end of it, he expects us to take on a concept which we cannot possibly verify. So what we've done is we've arrived at a paradox. In practice, practice diligently to drop our second-hand experience of concept and to stay with the direct first-hand world of changing phenomena. And if we do it successfully, where does it take us? To more concepts. The concept of universal impermanence, pain and not self. Another way of asking, of looking at this is, have we done all this work just to end up with another belief structure? Now, not only that, but according to the tradition, insight meditation, strictly speaking, begins when our meditation object is one or more of the three characteristics, the three universal characteristics, 
But if the three characteristics are concept, how do we know concept? Isn't noticing the practice that deconstructs concepts, that takes us to a world beyond concepts? Isn't that the whole idea? So we, we come across a paradox, and uh, what we're going to do next talk is try to explore this paradox and see where it takes us. But this is the paradox that we're faced with. The whole training is all about drop the concept, just stay with the actual experience. When you do that, we notice the actual experience is changing. And the Buddha goes beyond that and says all experience is subject to change. But as soon as he makes that move, has he just taken us back into a world of concepts? And what are we doing there? So, let's explore this in the next talk. And explore it in your own meditation practice. See, um, see what, what you come up with. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, just on that last point, in terms of the practice, will it get to a stage where the three characteristics of anicca, anatta, dukkha no longer be concepts? They are what will be the direct experience, the direct experience of impermanence. That's the idea. Uh, but how that works is quite mysterious, and this is what we, we want to explore. Interesting. So, because, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's it's um, yeah, it will take us into the nature of awareness itself, uh, which we haven't uh, talked much. We just so far we've just been taking awareness for granted, as if we know what it is. <laughs> okay. Well, I won't jump the gun then, because we do have a second talk with you, Patrick, on the twenty seventh of March. So maybe I'll leave my is to that talk then but uh, it leaves us all in a really interesting space to know how we get to understanding each other not the dukkha no longer as concepts but as direct experience um, so patrick we do have some questions that's online which i'm happy mm -hmm. to share with you so the first question is how are thoughts and perceptions and feelings connected ah so very technical one um, they're all part of the same general process of constructing a world. If you think about the Buddhist teaching on, on the senses, the six senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and minding, and the Buddha calls this sabha, everything. Now if you look at the five physical senses, each of them is a particular, or a sense, is a sensitivity. So take the, the eye. Um, there are two little parts of the body that are sensitive to light. So my hand is not sensitive to light, but these two parts are sensitive to light. So they pick up visual data. The ears are sensitive to sound, they pick up uh, audio data, and so on. Mind is all, so that each sense is a sensitivity to a particular form of data. The five physical senses each have their own unique streams of data. So the eyes do not hear, the ears do not see. So you've got these five streams of data coming towards us. Mind has its own unique data um, for what we've been calling the world of concept. But it also picks up these five uh, streams of physical data. So all of these streams of data flow into mind. And then the mind's job is to make meaning out of it, to create a meaningful world. So if we take, for example, perception, perception is recognition. Um, that gives us our sense of familiarity. So for example, I turn up in this mis quite mysterious phenomenon called the Zoom room, and I pretty much, pretty soon pick up that this is a Buddhist meditation group. I can tell because you've got that meta sign behind it. It's a clue. Now imagine someone who's never in their life ever had anything to do with meditation and they wouldn't have, have the, not, would not have the foggiest idea what meta means. And they turn up and think, what is going on here? I don't know what this is, who are these people? Because they don't have, the perception hasn't been worked out yet. So perception is based on experience. A good example is language. So if you, 
if you're listening to your native language, you just understand what's being said. But if you've ever had to undertaken the job of learning a second language, you know how much work is involved to train the mind to recognise this pattern of sound represents this meaning. That's the job of perception. The perception gives us a familiar world. Uh, what was the... Um, uh, thoughts and perception and feeling. Feeling is the, is the heart's response. I like, I don't like, I want, I don't want. I don't know, I'm confused. I'm either ignoring it or confused. So perception is essentially cognitive. It gives me a world of meaning. Feeling is affective, it's of the heart. It tells me how I'm responding to this world. And thinking is a kind of um, a higher level process um, that continues to make sense, sense out of it, but in a more a detailed way. So all of these factors and others, they're all working together to create a sense of me in my world. In other words, a sense of what the Buddha calls self. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, and Patrick, earlier there was someone who made this comment um, and slash question, perhaps it's connected to what you were just saying. So this person says, I've heard a bit about heart and brain coherence and connecting with your body. So can you speak a bit more about that? Uh, is, that it's not, is that on the chat? Uh, that was earlier in the chat. If you want to see it, I'm, I can send it to you now. Read it. Here we are. Heart plus brain coherence and connecting with your body. Well, in, in the Western world, we, we're obsessed with brains. Uh, we, we, we think that my, when people talk about the mind, you, you notice they often use the words mind brain and head interchangeably, as if they're the same thing, <laughs> which is absolutely ridiculous. And of course, there's all this brain research and things are popping away in the brain and so on and so forth. Um, but there is a recognition that this misses out something. The world misses out is the world of affect, the world of what the Buddha calls the raven, feeling. So what we would, in our culture, we tend to call the heart. So we, we have a, this division between the head and heart, between the cognitive aspects of experience and the affective aspect of experience. And the Buddha has the same thing. He, we just, he, he, he distinguishes these two, two aspects as well. So if you think about, for example, when the Buddha says, what is the fundamental problem that we have? Sometimes he'll say, it's delusion or ignorance, avijja, which is cognitive. Sometimes he'll say, it's tamha craving or drivenness, which is here, it's in the heart, it's affective. When the Buddha says, what is the fundamental solution to our problem? Sometimes he says, it's bodhi, awakening, enlightenment, which is here, it's waking up, it's understanding, oh, this is what's going on. Sometimes he'll say, it's nibbana, which is the going out of the fire, which is here, it's in the heart, it's affective. So a human being has both of these aspect. And so balancing them is very important in order to, to lead a balanced life. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, so we've got another question about what you were saying earlier about the paradox. Mm. It says, I don't understand why the paradox is a major thing. Wouldn't it be the case that if I get to a stage in practice where I think I've let go of everything, but I am still aware of the paradox, then I simply haven't let go of enough. And need to keep on meditating, uh, a position that I've been in ever since I started meditating anyway. Mm. Mm. It's an interesting statement. Uh, so if you if one is still aware of a par paradox, I think this is a very interesting state to be in. <laughs> because it, uh, it gives you something to pay attention to and makes things interesting. Uh, so fantastic, just keep meditating. <laughs> And yeah, maybe I'm just overstating my case just to get my audience interested. <laughs> and to come back on the 27th of March. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, I wouldn't get an invite to come back. <laughs> okay, next question. If we shouldn't obsess over labelling as an experience, as anything, 
and we should just experience it without judgment, then how do you fully appreciate the joy of it? If that makes sense. Just joy naturally arise without judgment of the experience. Hmm. Basically, uh, there's more room for joy when the, when the judgment goes away. Mm. The, the problem with the judgment, uh, it, it, it's not problem. There's it, not problem with, with judgment as such, like discernment. With the Buddha really emphasised this bit. The problem with our judgments is that most of them are based on the past. So we are creatures of habit, and we come to this present experience now highly conditioned by the past. And this gets in the way of our actually experiencing the present. And what people will find when they do it, for example, it's quite common in a meditation retreat, that will, there will come a time when the practitioner will, will say, oh, that's right. They get, they get a sense of the, the newness, the freshness of experience. It's like they would step out of the meditation hall and it's like, oh, it's like I've never been here before. It's new, it's fresh. And there's a, there's, there's a spaciousness and a joy in that. Because the past is not holding on to them, and they're just genuinely present. And then, of course, that involves a judgment. Yeah, this is nice. I should keep doing this. So the judgment is not, the judgment itself is not the problem. The problem is that most of our judgments are heavily conditioned by the past. And, of course, that means by our delusions and attachments. Patrick, would you say that because of that judgment, it's almost like that commentary that we have in our life, and that becomes, in some ways, a barrier between us and the direct experience. So instead and, of experiencing it, we have that judgment slash commentary. Yep, and that, of course, is the work of the self. Mm. Because the, notice the self is permanent. Mm. The self is a product of the past. And he doesn't change. Mm. That's the nature of the self. So that's where we're trapped. Mm. Yeah, and it's very true what you said about how the judgment is very much um, part of that habit and also part of the past and it relates to that. But um, would you say also that judgment, there is a sense of comparison as well and that's also mm. the opposite of the self, comparing something is better or worse mm. than what we want. Yep, that's, that's, the, that's the world of concept. And of course, that sense of comparison at heart is what the Buddha calls mana which is the, a central movement of the self. Mana is usually translated as conceit, but it means, literally, it means measure. Mm. It's an action noun from the, from the root ma to measure. Now, if, if you think about, if you measure something, you get out your ruler and you measure it. In doing so, what you've done is you've created a border where this thing that I'm measuring ends and the rest of the world begins. So fundamental position. Me in here, you out there. So this is the fundamental act of self. And when we and for the Buddha, falling awakening is the, the complete letting go of that moment. Very good. Um, and also, just coming back to that question too, the person was asking about not obsessing over labeling an experience, mm. connecting that with judgment. So the labeling or the noting practice in the Mahasi tradition. Um, that is that a labeling or noting practice that is without judgment? So that's the difference. Uh, this is this is great causes great confusion. Um, people think noting means labeling, and they think it because of this use of the English word to note. Mm. Um, but in, in, in Burmese, what there's a, there's a verb that means to aware, and this is. But if you notice that in English we don't use awareness as a verb, mm. we use it as a noun. I, we don't say I aware, we say I am aware. Yes. Um, but noting essentially means aware. But when the Mahasi's disciples were translating into English, they scratched their heads that these people don't have a verb for aware. We'll just use noting. That'll do. <laughs> and, and, and the labeling, the naming can be very, very useful. Uh, because it, it helps to aim the awareness precisely where you want it to go. And when you're practicing for insight, uh, precision in awareness is very important, much more important than if you're doing serenity meditation. So remember, insight meditation is all about change. Well, if you're going to see change very clearly, you need to distinguish between this and that. This becomes that. 
this M, that the M. So you need to be precise with the awareness. And the naming helps precision. But it's basically an optional added extra. You don't need it. Some people find it extremely useful and they use it a lot. Some people find it just gets in the way, gets, gets too conceptual and don't, it's not useful for them. And some people find that sometimes it's useful, sometimes it isn't. So it's, it's, the, it's the optional added extra, but the essential thing by noting you need directly awareness with or without the name. Doesn't matter. Directly awareness. Very good. Thank you. Someone has asked related to that, how about knowing instead of noting as a verb? Mm, um, that um, that would work. Uh, depend, but knowing in English can have a too conceptual um, mm -hmm. implication to it. I like awareing because there's no there's no conceptual as well. So I I like I, I talk about awareing <laughs> um, because it cuts through the, the concept. You, know, you, you can know um, you can know your way home, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, that's purely conceptual. But knowing the feel of sitting on this chair swaying backwards and forwards, that's not conceptual, it's direct. So it's, it's it, how we use language in meditation practice is very important because it, language easily leads us astray, but equally it can be very helpful if we find the right term. And this is one of the challenges when you undertake meditation practice is to use language skillfully. That, the Buddha spent a lot of time refining his language to get it right. Um, so if if knowing is helpful, go for it. Otherwise aware. <laughs> Otherwise aware. <laughs> Very good. Um, Patrick, another question slash comment. I've noticed people being stuck into pattern recognition to the point of near delusion and paranoia. Mm. Um, I imagine anything taken to extreme is going to get you into trouble. Um, pattern recognition is very much part of insight. But anything that um, takes you towards delusion and paranoia is obviously has become obsessive and it's mm -hmm. no longer crystal, it's no longer wholesome, it's no longer skillful. Mm -hmm. um, and meditation can, you know, people can have bad effects on meditation, for sure. It's quite red meaning. And um, some people really should not be doing insight meditation. And, but usually they only get some of this when they do, <laughs> which is one of the one of the problems. But yeah, anything anything that gets out of whack, anything that gets out of balance, can be really bad. And this is why your own discernment is so important. Uh, when you when you undertake a meditation practice, particularly if you're talking about in the context of Buddhist, in the context of the Buddhist teaching. He really emphasizes independence and making your own judgments about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, and you have to develop that capacity to make develop your own discernment. But it's really important when you undertake a meditation practice to recognize that I, as the practitioner, I'm the one in charge, not the teacher. The teacher is a guy, but I'm the one who's responsible because I'm the one who's doing it. Thank you. Um, another question. What is your opinion on new age spiritualism that focuses on looking for and recognizing patterns to improve their life? Depends what you mean by improve, doesn't it? Improve uh, air quotes. Yeah. Um, the problem with kind of new age, whatever, spiritualism, spirituality, spirit, whatever, is it's very much the Dharma of a consumer society where you, you know, I can take a bit of this, I can take a bit of that, I can mix it all together and I can improve my productivity at work or whatever. Um, that doesn't take us very far, in my view. And it's just my own prejudice, of course. Um, the Dharma is something vast and it's something that we surrender to. You, you can't pick and choose. Dharma. Doesn't work. You can't. You can't pick and choose reality. You just take on the whole package of it. Or not. Hey, great. Um, 
All right, so I'm just going to, we still have 10 minutes, so seeing if anyone else has any final questions, or we close off. And so, Patrick, for our next talk, which will be on the 27th of March, your topic is on seeing and understanding. Mm. So just share a little bit about that so people know what they're um, coming for next time. Well, we're, we're, this is where we explore the paradox. Uh, seeing is this direct awareness. Understanding is where that direct awareness expands out into something yeah. beyond the immediate. And how the Buddha talks about that transition is what we're going to be talking about next, next time. Very good. Can't wait. Can't wait. Um, so, Patrick, earlier you were talking about rebirth, and this is a topic that has come up in many of our talks. And still, it's something where people may grapple with. So someone just said that it's still something that they can't get their head around. So... Mm. Could you share with us more about rebirth, especially for those who really just can't believe in it um, and can't understand it? Uh, well, first of all, you don't have to believe in it. <laughs> it's completely unnecessary. Uh, as for wrapping one's head around it, it is quite something difficult to get a hold of, not simply because of the cultural distinctions, like it's not part of our Western culture but also because the Buddha's understanding of rebirth, of life after life, is based on his understanding of not-self, anatta. And this is the first, people usually assume that when the Buddha talks about rebirth, he's talking about personal survival after death. So post-mortem survival. He is not talking about post-mortem survival. He's talking about not-self, anatta. Uh, and and um, I do have a talk on on this subject for, for later later time we can explore it. But it's this the key is to under, to, to get that when the Buddha talks about rebirth, he's talking about it from the perspective of anatta, of not self. And if you don't get anatta, you're not going to get what he's talking about in terms of rebirth. You're going to assume it's all about me. Do I get to, to live on after? after death or not. I mean, that's people's basic attitude. If, if, if someone feels, well, after I die, I'm still going to be here in some form or another, then they're interested. If someone thinks, when I die, that's it, it's all over, they're not interested. And you notice that both these movements are all about me. It's all about the self. And what is fundamental yeah, to understand rebirth is for the Buddha, it's part of not-self. And someone's just commented, is it also related to anatta and karma? Uh, karma and, um, has, has got a lot to do with it because karma is all about look, uh, the, the, it's, you get the term kamma vipaka. Mm -hmm. Kamma is action. Mm -hmm. Vipaka is ripening, how the action ripens. Now, the ripening process can be instantaneous, bang, or it can take an immense period of time, any unit of time. Uh, and so that is obviously clearly interrelated to rebirth. Uh, for example, uh, in contemporary secular Buddhism, where people begin by saying there's no rebirth, mate, face it, when you're dead, you're dead. That's it. The same, those people will also be highly skeptical about the reality of enlightenment. But, and some will just simply say, look, enlightenment, quote unquote, is psychologically impossible. And Either they'll dismiss it completely, or they'll lower the standard dramatically, like the American internet gurus. Uh, and they say, look, if you're you know, relatively balanced and economists, then you're enlightened. Now, uh, why do these two go together? Why the, the rejection of rebirth on the one hand and the inability to come to terms with the idea of enlightenment on the, on the other hand, why do they come together? Because when you look at what the Buddha means, by enlightenment, it's perfectly obvious you need a very long time for this project. And if you've got to do it in a human lifetime, you probably won't make it. So you need much more time. And so it's a much it's much more cosmic kind of approach to understanding how the world works, which is completely alien to our the Western world. The Western world has always had a very narrow view of the universe. 
um, the Indian traditional Indian view of the university is immense, wide open, and we we def, we, we have problems accommodating that. Thank you, Patrick. Another question. Is there any emphasis on letting go in the Vipassana meditation, or is it just about being aware of Nicha Anatta and Dukkha? You cannot be aware of Nicha Dukkha Anatta without letting go. If you're holding on, you'll never see the characteristics. Okay, that was the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question that was sent to me currently. Are all paradoxes resolved when one stays in touch with ultimate reality? Yes, eventually. And when I say eventually, I'm using conceptual, I'm being conceptual here. <laughs> because time is just a concept. But yes, that's right. <laughs> Very good. I think that's all the questions tonight. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, Thank you. And my, again, my apologies for being late. I just completely lost it. That's okay. Time is but a concept. <laughs> um, but we are delighted to have you again on the 27th of March so I hope everyone can join that session it's going to be very interesting especially that book that uh, Patrick has left us with so if you want to find out more then please join us and we it will be same time same place 27th mm -hmm. and Patrick can I invite you to end the session tonight with a closing either a closing prayer or a dedication or something um, okay, uh, merit is a poor translation of punya, which essentially means auspicious power. So may the power of what we've done tonight um, radiate throughout the universe, not restricted to any one person or to any one group of people, but in the spirit of our time, spread everywhere and everywhere. Thank you, Patrick. Um, there seems to be some sound interference. No? Okay, so that's fine. Um, so thank you so much, Patrick. That was amazing. And we just have some short announcements, which I'll in, um, just ask everyone to stay behind for a little bit of. So every Wednesday, we have these talks. And next Wednesday, we have Ajahn Yul who is from Thailand and is highly practiced. So I invite all of you to be there. It's going to be excellent. And it's same time, same place, online or in person. Tuesdays, we're still having yoga sessions. And Wednesday, but and Mondays, we have meditation. And also, we have a retreat that we're running this weekend. It's a by donation retreat and it is with Ben Wolby Mulker. And we also have a nine-day retreat with Bhante Ananda from Canada on natural samadhi and that um, all the details of that is on our website very interesting we have a bhutanese cultural festival and a celebration of not just the bhutanese culture but also the different cultures in buddhism as well on the 13th of april so i hope you can join for that that's at the western sydney university in Parramatta, or you can join us online of course in person is going to be so much better there's stores there's food stores lots of stuff happening and it's a free event so i would love to have you come and celebrate with us if you would like to join our other activities and stay in touch, you can join our newsletter as well as also our WhatsApp chat. Follow us on Facebook, check out um, our website as well for updates. And if you would like to make a donation to the Mentor Centre, we'll really appreciate that because that will help us continue to organise events free to the public so that other people can also access the Dhamma as well. So thank you all so much for joining. It's been a wonderful and deep session. And thank you again, Patrick, for coming and sharing your time and spending your sharing your wisdom with all of us. And I can't wait to our next event with you on the 27th of March. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye.